going to uh, introduce uh, today's keynote speaker, Michael Curry. Michael Curry is the, uh, for those of you who don't know him, I think most of you do, but I'm going to say this anyway. He's the SVP and general counsel of the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers. He's also a longtime past president of the Boston NAACP and is currently on the board of the national NAACP. And he's one of the first New Englanders uh, to serve on the national board since the 70s. You may have not known that little tidbit. Uh, what I'm sure you do know is that he tirelessly works on behalf of civil rights in Boston and across the country. And he's even been honored by Mayor Walsh for doing that. Another little tidbit that you may not know is he has an acting credential. You can talk to him about that later. Um, but in all seriousness, um, it was really, really important for me when I came on board as the managing director of Perscolas and I knew this graduation was coming for Michael to be the keynote speaker for our first graduation. Um, so, so I ran over to his office and he didn't, he also said, Perscolas, Robin, what is that? Um, then I told him and uh, within seconds he said, I'll do it. Um, and I couldn't be more honored um, to have you and I'd like to now welcome you to the stage for your remarks. So it is uh, absolutely an honor and a blessing whenever I'm invited to provide remarks at a graduation. Um, it's funny because in the work that I've done over the last 20 plus years, I get requests to come speak and they're usually the first thing I ask is who's asking me to come? Uh, and when I get a call from, from Robin, I know it's important. Uh, I know that what she's asking me to do is very much aligned with what I do for a living, making a difference. The work of civil rights and social justice is about building a diverse pipeline. And when she came by and said, Mike, I need you to do this, was, was out of question um, that I needed to be here. Um, as she said, I didn't know much about Briscolis, but I knew a lot about her work with Euro, which is where she came from before this. Uh, and then it introduced me to the work of Prescolis, and I was a fan already. So I've already talked you up across the country. <laughs> no exaggeration. Been on the phone talking about this program and what it means for the work that we're doing and all the hats that I wear in social justice and civil rights. And, and as we know, a good job with a good salary can transform a family and transform a community. And that's the, we sometimes think of this in just an individual with a job, but no, I have a, a bigger understanding that when you give a person a good job, they bring that money back, those dollars back, they impact the neighborhood stores, uh, they, they build up better school systems, and all those dollars that they do to, to make our communities better. So thank you, Prescolas. Round of applause for Prescolas, please. So I don't have prepared remarks, but I'm gonna share with you uh, what I was asked to come and talk about. But I think first and foremost, before some housekeeping, um, I'd like to ask, because I was a, a, a gentleman born and raised in, in Boston who went back to school at night to get my, my law degree, uh, as I knew the sacrifice my sons and my family had allowing me go to, to go back to school. So I'm going to ask the graduates to stand up and give your families a round of applause for all they did to put you in this position. So please. The other thing, uh, I talked to a few family members and I think there's an agreement that they're all taking you to the most expensive restaurant when you leave here today. <laughs> That's their thank you for you going through this program and finishing. Um, I'm gonna talk just briefly on a few things and then I really want to allow you to get to the ceremony and enjoy uh, your graduation. Um, there's a, uh, an African proverb that says, if you know the beginning well, the end won't trouble you. I'm going to repeat that. If you know the beginning well, the end won't trouble you. So kind of what brings me here to speak today, I want to just share my story a little bit and talk about some things I've learned in my career. So one is, uh, and maybe folks don't know this, I was born and raised in Boston City Hospital, hospital uh, a kid in Lenox Street housing projects, single mom, two older, si uh, older sister and younger sister. Uh, and if you knew the late 60s, early 70s of Boston, um, that was a lot of poverty in Lenox Street Housing Projects, right? There was all these project areas, Columbia Point, Mission Hill, Lenox, 
I was one of those kids that had family in those other places, but I was in the housing projects. I didn't have a dad in my home. I never knew a night, a day with a father in my household. I knew a mom who played both roles, who was my dad and my mom. Um, I knew communities that were impacted by violence and crime and poverty and substance abuse, but I didn't understand it. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't understand how when I was in Roxbury, I would walk through the neighborhoods of Lenox Street housing projects or go visit family in Columbia Point or people in Mission Hill, and people who looked like me were dealing with all those issues. And then I'd go to Rochester, New York, or South Side Chicago, or parts of Detroit, or St. Louis, and I would see the same thing. Uh, and as a kid, I didn't understand it, but I internalized it, and I could what is it about black and brown people that were struggling with this stuff? And it didn't, it didn't really come to me until I left my neighborhood and went to college in Minneapolis, St. Paul. College I couldn't even afford to go visit. Um, they accepted me. I wanted to get away from Boston as far away as I could get. I wanted to get away from home. Uh, and put my application in and was accepted to a small liberal arts college, actually two, for anybody that knows colleges. One was Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, in the woods. <laughs> and as great as Carleton is, Carleton was, I think, number 10 in college, 10 or 12 in the country in college uh, standards at that time. And McAllister was probably in the 20s. And I went there, uh, I went there for a writing program for the summer in high school. And I told them, I'm from Roxbury, from the inner city. I cannot be in the woods for four years. No offense to Carlton. And they were great. They said, take a look at the college in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and it was McAllister College. So you got this poor kid on welfare from Roxbury, Dorchester, now packing up to move out to Minnesota and attend a college in McAllister College. And it was an experience. And it was interesting about me telling you the story today. I did not expect my roommate from McAllister to be in the room. Tom Evans, where are you at, Tom? <laughs> when I tell you, <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> um, there is challenges that are faced when inner city kids are trying to aspire to do great things and have these great experiences, get a great education like you got. And then you step out of your comfort zone, your taste of home, and you go to these places that people don't look like you, that they don't always dress like you, that they don't have your hair so they don't understand why you comb it or why you braid it, right? And then you get on a college campus, and in my case, in McAllister, and there are people that just embrace you, and they don't, they don't see your color, and they treat you like your family to them. And I'm going to tell you, Tom was that person. And I say that. He's here, but I'm telling you the story. Um, it was important for me, coming from Roxbury, to find friends on that campus who I didn't feel like I was alone. Tom was that kid as a roommate. Um, I won't tell you all the stories about we lived in the same dorm room. <laughs> we'll try to forget some of those stories. But we had a great experience. And, and here's why I tell you about the story of McAllister. That was my opportunity. Because I think sometimes we don't, uh, we don't appreciate that people of color, poor people, poor white, black, brown people are looking for that opportunity to just set them on the path to success. And for me, when I accepted that invitation to go to McAllister, it introduced me to, to new experiences, new people. It introduced me to a rigorous education. Um, I definitely look back at my career and I say, I'm here because of McAllister. I'm here because I had the right professors who took an interest in me. Uh, we were talking a minute ago, Rob and I and some of the other uh, coordinators for Prescolis about setting the bar. My bar was here. Like, I thought as soon as I left Roxbury, Dorchester and got to college, I was done. I was like, I'm one of the few kids in my neighborhood to go to college. Okay, I'm done. What I appreciated that I had and you had here at Prescola is that somebody else had a higher bar for me. They knew that, no, you need to be a lawyer. Like, you need, and there's some people at college who wanted me to run for mayor. <laughs> I didn't do that. But people had a higher bar for me. They had expectations, and you need that. I needed that. That is one of the reasons I'm so impressed with Prescola is because they're providing that higher bar that you may not even be able to see. Um, my career, so I came back from McAllister and St. Paul, and I had a drive to do social justice. And I had a drive for all the reasons I talked about. I knew that there was a reason why people who looked like me were poor, why there was so much drug addiction, why there was so much chronic unemployment. I knew that that was not natural, that there was a history to that. And I got to college, and all of a sudden, I learned about all these things like slavery and reconstruction, not the surface understanding that most people have, the academic understanding of what it meant to people's careers and, and their self-esteem and what it meant, 
the film Birth of a Nation. How, raise your hand if you've ever seen the film Birth of a Nation. So only a, a half of you have seen it. When Robin mentioned I'm in a film, I'm in a film called Birth of a Movement about the film Birth of a Nation, which was a 1915 racist propaganda film that had all those disgusting images of African, Marin, African Americans that, quite frankly, if you watch the 1915 film, you will draw those comparisons to how we look at people of color today. It'll be clear. Because, quite frankly, it's easier to shoot somebody on the street if you don't think that their life matters. It's easier to not hire them, to not educate them, to uh, provide counseling different, to treat them in the healthcare field differently if you don't value their lives. That's what you'll see when you read, when you watch the film Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Movement is a film about the 1915 film, and I get to play William Monroe Trotter in the film. Uh, some history that you may not know about Boston is in Boston in 1915 when the film came out, the largest protest against that film was here in Boston. William Monroe Trotter, the Boston NAACP, organized the protest, the showing of that film, the first film to be shown in the White House, right? And then decided that this was going to be ground zero to stop that film from being shown across the country. Because what would happen? People like Trotter understood it. If you put that image out across the country, it would perpetuate the stereotype and the treatment, the mistreatment of people of color across the country. So they said, you know what, to, to be damned with First Amendment rights, we're going to fight ground zero to stop the showing of this film. And they lost. Trotter and the others lost, but it was a campaign. Many would say it was the first campaign that led to other civil rights protests. It was a model for how to organize. 10,000 folks marching on Boston Commons to Tremont Theater to stop the showing of that film. So it was an honor to walk in one day, and I, I walk into the film. To, to, uh, someone said, Mike, do you want to be an extra in the film? I said, oh, yeah, definitely want to be an extra in the film. I come in my, my civil rights suit. I show up. Everyone else is in their 1915 clothes. The director, producer of the show looks at me. She goes, uh, you did know that this was a casting call. You had to wear 1915 clothes, right? So I ended up dressing in. You know, they, they took some clothes off other people. They had me put on the clothes. And then they said, you know what, can you read this line? Can you read this line? And I end up getting cast to play the major character in the film. So I'm actually very hot. I'm, I'm not a really an actor. So, so don't expect to see me uh, in any other movies. But it was a great first experience. Um, I say that because it, it is a part of my story about civil rights activism and social justice. That's essentially what you do here. That's essentially what Perscolas does. It's actually preparing you to go back into your communities, to uplift your families, to be stronger uh, individuals, and to contribute to your families and your communities. I can't stress enough how many of the challenges we face are because people aren't equipped with what they need. They don't have the experience, the training, and they don't have the education. And they're giving you that. Um, I'm very fortunate as well. Um, I left McAllister, came back to Boston, and I wanted to do civil rights work, so I came back here. Uh, as I got back, someone said, you know what, if you went to church, you'd have a job by now. For the people in here who go to church, um, everybody in, in the church works in HR, <laughs> for real. Ch check it. Ask people around church, like everybody at church works in HR. So I went to church that one. My mother said, go to church, you have a job. I went to church maybe a, three months after getting back from college, and I had like six job offers. Uh, people had known me since I was a kid, and they were willing to take a chance on me, and they appreciated that, that they knew me, and I'd gone to college and come back, and all of a sudden I had all these offers to work. Um, I still wanted to do social justice, and I knew I could take a career that would have me doing a job, but not necessarily what my passion was, because my passion was to make a difference. So I got a chance to do both. I got hired at Blue Cross Blue Shield, and this is the career advice for you, right? I ended up working at Blue Cross Blue Shield for 16 years, um, and I've been at my current job for 11. So 16 years right out of college of working at Blue Cross and Blue Shield, and there were some valuable lessons I learned that I want to impart, I want to share with you, and some, some critical lessons that will help you in your career. So one of them I learned is always be your own worst critic. Do not ever let someone sit down with you and tell you what you're not good at. Spend that time to understand if your writing's not tight, if you're not always on time, if you don't pick up those concepts that you should pick up and, and get your work done in a way that is quality. Don't ever let anyone shock you and tell you what you don't already know about yourself. That may seem simple, but I tell you as I speak across the country and talk about what you need to enter the workforce, critical one. Because I now have a staff 
of a whole team of people who do government relations, community relations, and I tell them, don't ever let me shock you in a meeting. You should already know. So that's one. Um, work for yourself. I worked for a woman when I was at Blue Cross, and she said, Michael, you always work for Michael Curry Incorporated. No matter who you think you work for, you really work for yourself. That means when you enter a job, you're thinking, okay, I need to understand every aspect of this job so it makes me in line for whatever opportunities come up. Because if you, hire, if you get hired in a job and you think narrowly, I got hired to do X, then you'll just do X. But if you work for yourself, you're gonna wanna understand what your job is and your job is so that whenever the opportunity presents itself to say, hey, you know what, we need a new vice president of this department. They're gonna say, you know what, Victor knows that information. Victor's prepared with that. Victor's been in that place, and we know that Victor typically sits in a room and he has an answer to that question. You want to be that employee. Um, always expand your knowledge is tied to that. Um, I'm a person who's very much a fan of anyone who is always looking to learn. Take the courses. Even if it's not directly in your line of, of employment, take the courses. Take those job opportunities, those, those education opportunities inside and outside the organization. It is by far, as an employer, someone I'm looking for that is never satisfied with what they know. No matter how smart you are, no matter how you think you're good at your job, be that person that's hunger, hungry for information. Um, I'll tell you, don't do what I did. Like, I'm, I'm very, and I'll use the spiritual term, blessed. I never planned, right? Everything that good happened in my life is not because I planned it. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time, and someone said, okay, we'll hire him, we'll promote him, we'll give it to him. Don't do that. <laughs> now, I've been very fortunate, but I've watched what happens when you plan it, right? When you plan out your career and you decide, okay, I'm going to do this for three years, then I'm going to focus on this other skill, and then I'm going to ask for a promotion, then I want to be at this salary level. I'm super impressed by the people that I work with and for and around who plan out their success. Don't ever let it just happen. Spend that time to figure out what you want in your career and plan it. Because I'm going to tell you about, and as some of the older folks in the room, I just turned 50 um, last year, life goes by like this. And you'll open your eyes one day and you'll say, you know what? Wow, 25 years went by and I'm still doing the same thing. Or I never went back and got that education. The other thing is take risks. The number one thing that I know when you talk to people in their careers is nobody wants to take a chance. I want to start a business, but they never do it. I want to go back to school, but I don't have the money, but I have kids. You can always come up with reasons why you shouldn't do something. I went back to law school at night, did not have the money to do it, had still the undergrad bills to pay for McAllister. Um, I had two sons at the time. I was already deeply involved in the NAACP and leading all these organizations and on national boards. And I said, you know what? I had an advisor that told me, you need to be a lawyer one day. And I said, you know what? Now's the time to do it. And I went back to school at night, four nights a week. They say part-time. Don't ever tell you, let anyone tell you that law school at night is part-time. It's four, four nights a week, and it's one less class than the day students. And I spent all that time studying, and I just found a way to make it work. So never, ever let yourself limit yourself and, and take those risks. That's important. Um, build a network of mentors. Um, mentors, and I say slash sponsors. Um, I get a chance to mentor a lot of people. And I can tell you that there are many people, as I've, I've written their job recommendations, I've gotten them jobs at other companies, uh, places to work. You need to have a mentor for a lot of different things. You need to have a personal mentor, someone who can just help you guide as a, as a father, as a mother, as a parent, um, as, a, as a person living in the community, as a social, act, social justice person, uh, and then in your professional career. So I have at least five people that I call on on a regular basis to help me figure out what to do next. Really rely on mentors. Um, someone also said to me, be a student of the sport. And they said it in relation to basketball when I was a student in college, right? So he said, okay, you play basketball, Division Three, but what do you know about basketball? What do you know about the athletes who came before you? What do you know what made them good or what made the school successful? Even though McAllister was horrible, but that's another story. <laughs> and the lesson I learned for him crossed basketball and sports is about life. So when you enter the tech field, who do you know are the players in the tech industry? Like, who do you know who's doing that work and, and what makes them successful? What products do they have? You need to be the student of the sport, not just do the job that you're hired to do. Very important. 
Um, a little bit of all of that, I would say, for, for I don't know your personal stories, but one of the quotes I live by is a Frederick Douglass quote, and it comes to my story. It says, it's not just the heights you reach, but the depths from which you come. I'm going to repeat that. You can tweet it, do all that right now, social media. Not just the heights you reach, but the depths from which you come. What it said for me is when I came from Roxbury, single parent home, latchkey kid, living in the projects, on welfare, in the environment that I grew up in, and then I was sitting next to Tom at school, I knew what I had to go through to get there. I knew the challenges, I knew the statistics where I wasn't supposed to be there. I knew the statistics were, were that I wasn't supposed to graduate. And then when I look back, I even appreciate it more. Now that, that experience made me stronger, made me wiser. And now when I think back to my career and now I go to the White House for meetings, me, sitting in meetings at the White House, maybe not as much now as I did under Obama administration, <laughs> just to be honest. <laughs> it was under the prior administration I went to the White House. <laughs> but to sit in Congress and meet with members of our congressional delegation about issues and, and they want my input on, um, I'm always reminded of it's not just the heights you reach, but the depths from which you come. You got to remember that. Your struggles, your challenges make you stronger, and they're what's prepared you for the success that's yet to come. Um, there's a lot I can share with you about professional career. I think I shared a few tips. Most importantly is never be satisfied. Never be satisfied with where you are. Never be satisfied with what people offer you. Always be hungry to learn more, to, to make more money to have a better title, to be more successful. And then last but not least, don't forget the rest of us. Um, and here's what I mean by don't forget the rest of us. I, I'm not a fan of people who just have, are career driven. Don't just finish Prescola's, maybe pursue other careers, get into your tech job, make good money, and forget what, what you're here to do. You're here to do more than that. Um, I like to use the analogy of the little white kid in the movie um, Sixth Sense. Anyone's ever seen the movie Sixth Sense? What's the classic line from the movie? I see dead people. <laughs> Everybody remembers the movie. I, I use the analogy of that because that little kid in the movie is an analogy for me to what you're faced with. He saw dead people and they were challenging him to get up and do something about it, to help them. That's how I see the social justice issues in our society today. Racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, and go down the list. We're in a, we're in a strange time right now where you can do what that little kid did in the movie and you can cover your head up and ignore all of this. You can pretend it doesn't exist. So for all those people pre-Obama that said we're post-racial, for all those people that says, hey, I think life is great, I'm gonna challenge you to go down to Roxbury right now and stand in Dudley Station for an hour. I won't even make you stand there for a day. I'm gonna challenge you to go to Southside Chicago and spend a day in a neighborhood on the South Side or Harlem. You will understand it's not just about a career and a job. This can't be just about you making money and being successful. It has to be about you bringing that talent back and making our communities and this country better. Sounds lofty, right? But it's real. That if you go down the list, and I'm going to tell you about the work of the NAACP, and I'll finish it on that. People always say, well, Mike, um, where's the NAACP on all these issues? And I say, well, anybody who ever asked that question don't, doesn't understand how many issues there are, <laughs> right? I said, so imagine this room is a drop-down box on every corner of the room. And I go housing in the corner over here, and it's predatory lending, it's evictions, it's this, go down the list. There's 40 things I can name off the top of my head. Then let's go here to economic development and the, the, the uh, job deserts that exist in some of our communities where there's no employment across the country. Or the um, discrimination within our employment. And, and the list is long on the economic development side or the con contractors of color who don't get contracts. Healthcare, disparate treatment, um, the mental health versus the physical health disparities and people don't get access to mental health care. And what does that mean when you don't get access to mental health care or the substance use services? I can go around the room, every corner of the room is a different topic and a different drop down box. And I say, okay, that's the work of the NAACP. There's somebody right now that's expecting us to show up at a hearing, at a meeting, to change things. So I say to you as a challenge to the graduating class, it's not just about the NAACP, it's about the work. That I don't care what your issue is, your lane that you choose to be in, go ahead and be successful, but come back and make a difference. 
Be active in your communities and change our condition collectively. Raise the consciousness of a nation. This is an exciting time because everybody's challenging the stuff that we thought we knew. <laughs> right? That's why Biden's in trouble right now. That's why all these people are being challenged and monuments are coming down and we're rethinking curriculums. This is the most exciting time. You need to embrace that excitement and be a part of it. So I'm challenging you, graduating class. Prescolis has given you a talent, a skill that's now going to propel you into making good money. And I'm going to just tell you just really quickly, I'm going to share some stuff with you about your field that I thought was interesting. The average IT professional receives 32 job solicitations a week. Right? So that's just IT, sort of the techie field, that people want you because they don't know where you are, because there's not enough of you in the pipeline, and they need your, your skills and your training. Um, tech talent workers can, can afford to be choosy when looking for work. A majority of tech workers are extremely satisfied with their job. Now, there's a satisfaction gap that exists. Many people are not happy with their job. You're interested, you'll be interested to know in the tech field, over 71% of you actually like what you do. Right? And one of the things that makes it exciting is it's always new. You're, you're always experiencing new things. You're challenged to learn new things. It's not as, as, as happy in other fields. Um, that's the place you're in. I want to share that with you because I'm excited. I'm excited that you're graduating. I'm excited that you're about to make good money. Make good money. Do I have to say that again? You're about to make good money. Um, and I'm just asking you, asking you sincerely to not take that for granted come back and make a difference. So I want to say thank you, congratulations. Uh, please, just another round of applause for Prescolis and all the investment that they put into all of you. It is a blessing and an honor, and I don't say this lightly. I'm around, so if you're looking and you're thinking about jobs and careers and you need, I'm in the healthcare space, right? I represent every community health center in the state. That's 52, over a million patients. Uh, I get to, to do their advocacy, both legal uh, and on the government relations side. Um, I know what's happening down the road as I deal with the legislature and Congress. Um, keep in touch. Let me know what you're doing. Let me know what you're thinking. I look forward to, to talking to you more. Thank you. But I'm just as excited to now introduce the valedictorian of our graduating class, Elias Kim, to share some remarks with you. Thank you, Robin. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to begin by thanking everyone for being here today. Uh, per school of staff, Robin, Tesfai, Chelsea, and Rich, uh, for your guidance and uh, genuine concern for our success. Also to the uh, Per School of National Team as well. And also to our friends, family, and fellow classmates for your unconditional support and encouragement. And also a big thank you to our generous funders and supporters who made all of this possible for us and our future cohorts. And uh, my name is Elias Kim, and I'd like to give you a quick little backstory of why I'm here today. Uh, I graduated high school back in 2005, and I went into university immediately afterwards with a full ride, but uh, life led me to withdraw during my freshman year. Uh, since then, I've moved to many different cities, pursuing different opportunities, uh, to advance my job status. Some of these opportunities included a role as an operations manager for an LA Fitness, uh, an internal service advisor for multiple Toyota dealerships, and an inside sales and purchasing role at a major building material distributor. But despite the chance to learn these new skills and adapt to new environments many times over, my life felt stagnant. As if with every good opportunity, uh, I would hit a wall without any way up or around. I felt as if I was just going through the motions, day after day. But what I was missing was a goal, uh, purpose, and true ambition. I knew it was time for a change. In March, I made the conscious decision to drop everything and move to Boston, uh, where I'd be close to my family, and finally pursue an education. However, dedicating four years to go back to university to obtain an undergraduate degree was just not in the cards for me at this point. And then I stumbled upon Perscolis. Um, and Perscolis enabled me to obtain the first of many tech certifications to come in just a couple of months. Uh, being at Perscolis has motivated me to pursue an engaging career path and not just another unfulfilling job. 
Tech hasn't always been foreign to me, as I've always been hands-on, um, from building my own computers in the past to repairing my own cars. But I never really truly considered these interests as a potential career. But then I was introduced to the vast, ever-changing tech industry, and Persicolis uh, provided me with not only new knowledge and skills, but also provided me with clarity. It provided me a clarity in which direction I'd finally want my future to go. There's always something new to learn and continuously improve upon in this field. The last 10 weeks have been quite a journey, though a short 10 weeks. We've all learned so much and overcome many challenges together daily. I've also learned a lot about who I am and about my character, especially in a time where I really felt lost. For school, this holds true to many core values, but three really stand out to me. Ambition, resourcefulness, and perseverance. These three core values remind me every single day, what do I want, how badly do I want it, and what will I do to get it? Many of us joined this program as a first step into a career change, and doing this shortly after moving to a new city was quite daunting for me. But being surrounded by my peers, like-minded, driven individuals, really kept me motivated. For example, Aniti, uh, just days after having a newborn baby, congratulations, by the way, um, he dedicated this program Monday through Friday to be here, and Hector, who also moved to Boston alone just a month before the program started, um, both of them demonstrated these core values. And all of us in the Boston Per Scholars class, uh, uh, all of us in the Boston Per Scholars class did. We all live such different lives, but we all came together with one common goal, for the betterment of ourselves and our careers, and we persevered. In the classroom, our, our instructor Tesfai taught us necessary technical skills to begin a career in IT. Through career development led by our national team, uh, we were exposed to various situations which eventually led us to, and I quote Robin, to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And because of this, I've seen incredible uh, progress amongst all my, all my peers. So what's next? Now that we've earned our CompTIA a certification, we're ready to embark onto the next step of this exciting journey. We're all aggressively conducting our job searches, and many of us have already begun studying to soon become Network Plus certified. The last 10 weeks have created within me a thirst for knowledge and the de desire for continuous self-improvement. And I eagerly look forward to the next chapter of our lives. I congratulate my peers for your hard work has paid off and I wish us the best of luck as we work together to succeed. Thank you.